This short series is now called Repairing a Stuart Model's Number 1 Steam Engine. This is part 2, repairing the valve gear, setting the valve timing and making a new key for the flywheel. But the first thing I'm going to do is fix this valve gear. This lever is just a mess, everything is sloppy, the valve gear cannot possibly work until this is taken care of. I really should have added this to the title, but then the title would have been too long. I'm pulling this pin out at the moment, and to me, this looks awfully like a nail. Yes, I'm pretty sure this is a nail that's been tapped into the hole through the lever and the shaft. So if you're building a steam engine at the moment, and think it's a good idea to put a nail through a hole, it's not a good idea, so please don't do it. At least whoever did this took the sharp point off the nail. What I'm about to do is fit taper pins through tapered holes in these components. I'll just take out this split pin which is doing absolutely nothing for the steam engine. And what I'm about to do is ream a tapered hole through this component. And for this job I am of course using a taper reamer. You have to be very careful with these things because they will grab in the work and break off quite easily. And really that would not be a good thing because the taper reamer broken off in the work would actually secure the component to the cross shaft, but it would look really horrible. So try and avoid snapping taper reamers off in the holes you are reaming. Even though it's not shown on the screen, just below this job is a piece of cloth which is catching any swarf or metal particles that fall from the hole. And it's always a good idea to do this if you're doing a job like this in situ, because any metal particles in the bearings would not be a good thing. When the reamed hole is at the correct depth, it's time to tap in a taper pin. Now I'm doing this more gently than it looks on screen. I'm using lots of light hammer blows. I'm definitely not using any ultraviolence on an engine like this. To some modelers out there, this must look a little bit scary, and indeed it is, particularly this part. I'm using my electric drill to enlarge the hole through the cross shaft. And if anyone's interested, it is a DeWalt drill. I really do like DeWalt drills. I also have a Makita drill, which is of no consequence because I'm not using it for this job. Anyway, the hole was drilled successfully. It starts off as a 1 8 of an inch parallel hole. Now I'm using the taper reamer to make it fit the taper pin, or the other way around. Again, the hammer blows are many and very light. And I would just like to mention that I do not recommend hitting other parts of the engine that are in close proximity to the taper pin. The drop arm is at a perfect 90 degrees to the reversing lever, with no play in either component. The only problem is, I cannot get full reverse on the expansion link when the lever is at the top of its travel. And that's because the bracket that locks the lever in place will not allow the lever to go high enough. So this bracket needs remachining to allow the lever to go a little bit higher. I think I'll take this opportunity to tighten this bolt on the eccentric strap. This is very very loose and very rattly, and although it's not a major issue on a steam engine, you can have rattly eccentric straps, they still do their job. But if they're as loose as this, they will make a bit of a clattering noise that you can really do without. There are quite a few more jobs to do on this engine and I'm going to make the eccentrics a much better fit than this. But my main brief for this episode is to get the engine running, because it doesn't run very well at all in either direction. It will basically run in one direction, sort of, but the other way it's a no-no. But by the end of this episode, something should be happening, and I will be able to be put back in my padded room a happier man. Everything feels much more positive. The reversing lever and the drop arm are as one, but the bad news is, it still will not go in reverse. No matter what I do, it doesn't want to go backwards. The engine is now running in forward gear quite well. As you can see in this clip, the reversing lever is just bobbing up and down a little bit. But this is good, it's not even clamped to the bracket. And by the sound of the engine, the valve timing is not correct either. But all will be revealed later on in the episode. What I need to do first is fix this bracket. And it's a simple fix, I just machined off the boss and then refitted the bracket. I even reprofiled the rear of the clamp that clamps the reversing lever to the bracket, and this allows it to go all the way to the top. And not unsurprisingly, it now runs in reverse, well, sort of runs in reverse. 
It's a bit lumpy, in fact it's incredibly lumpy. One thing that makes this engine look a lot worse than it is, is the base is uneven. I think what I'm going to do is remove the engine from the base and try and pack up the base so that it sits squarely on the table. It's wobbling a little bit, which doesn't help when the engine's going fast. But progress has been made. The engine is now running in reverse, and it's running in reverse slowly. And that's always a good sign. Mind you, there's so much slop on everything else on this engine, there's nothing really there to bind. I think it's time to have a look at this wobbly flywheel. Removing the flywheel was surprisingly difficult. I'm using a piece of hardwood to stop the crankshaft from turning while I twist off the flywheel. But getting the flywheel to come off the very last bit took quite a while as you can see from the video. This is nothing more than a gratuitous shot of one of the main bearings and it's to remind me that they both need a little bit of attention. Both of them are quite slack. So I'll be taking care of this in the next episode. I'm more concerned with the flywheel at the moment. I've refitted it and it's running slightly more true than it was. And here's the original key, which is a real rattle fit. No good at all. I'm going to make another one. Yes, there's a little less run out. It's not quite as wobbly. I don't think I'm ever going to get this to be perfect unless I remachine it. Here's the original key. So I'm going to file one up from a piece of metal. And the first thing to do is to locate the piece of metal. I'm using this. And I cut down it with my bandsaw. It's not a particularly accurate cut, but it doesn't need to be for what I'm doing. And by using a file, and of course my one inch belt sander, I end up with a key that is a better fit in the slot. The only problem is, the slot in the crankshaft is slightly less than the slot in the flywheel. So I'm using a piece of brass to persuade the key to sit into the crankshaft a little bit more. And as you can see from this clip, there's still some run out, but it's a lot better than it was. I'll see what happens to the concentricity of the flywheel once I tighten up the main bearings. I have to post a warning on this next bit. It's really boring. If you are prone to slipping into a coma, it's possibly time to get up and make some tea. It's not boring for me actually doing the job because I'm quite busy looking at the ports and seeing how the valve's travelling over the ports. But for the moment, it's time to remove the valve. This time round, I haven't actually shown me removing the valve. I'm just showing me adjusting it. I took the valve out and reprofiled it because the metal plate that soldered onto the front of it was too big and in the wrong position. So now it's in the correct position. And once I get the timing right and the valve travel correct, the engine should start to run a little better. This is a very long, drawn-out process. Checking the timing, checking the position of the valve. And don't forget we have two sets of eccentrics, a forward and reverse set. So you have to make sure that the valve travels the same amount when driven from each eccentric. And this is somewhat of a compromise. If the engineering is really good, then that's a bonus, but often it isn't, so you do have to compromise. It's okay to have the engine running slightly better in forward than reverse, and this really follows full-size practice. If you listen to some steam locomotives in reverse, the beats are not quite so even as they are in forward gear. And it really is a combination of how the valve travels over the port and how much adjustment you have. Don't forget the valve fork can be turned and then re-bolted to the expansion link die block. This allows adjustment of the position of the valve relative to the expansion link. And yet again I'm removing the valve chest cover because I need to see where the valve is from both ends. So here's the valve and I'm rotating the engine first of all in forward gear to make sure that the valve uncovers the ports evenly at both ends. Then I put the engine into reverse gear and here's the lever and I rotate the engine in the opposite direction and see what happens with the valve. And as you can see, the lever's moving as well, which doesn't help. You have to approximate it, and eventually you will get it right. If you want more information on this subject of how to time a steam engine, have a look at my Model Engineering for Beginners, where there's a whole episode just dedicated to timing a Stuart 5A. And by doing this, I've come to the conclusion that the valve is slightly too high. So if you watch the thread that's sticking out of the top of the valve, as I rotate the valve fork, which was two turns, it's now sticking up a little bit more. 
so now the valve is lower relative to the expansion link, and this time when I rotate the crankshaft, the valve is more even over both of the ports. Here in England, on television, we used to have a really excellent comedy show that they don't seem to show much these days. It was called The Fast Show, and some of the sketches were very simple but very clever. And one of these Fast Show sketches springs to mind when I'm doing this. It was a spoof interview between a man who did stop-motion photography and an interviewer. And the interviewer said, Well, what's the principle of stop-motion photography? And then the man just said, well, you move the arm a little bit, only a tiny amount, and then you take a picture. Then you move the arm a tiny amount again, and then you take a picture. And he went on and on and on. Then he said, then you'd move the leg as well, a tiny amount. And the interviewer was getting ready to sort of leap off a high public building. And I just thought this was really funny. And it's a little bit like this. So you just move the valve fork a very tiny amount. And then if that doesn't work, you move the valve fork back a tiny amount. Then you move the eccentric a tiny amount. And if you've moved it in the wrong direction, you move it a greater amount the other way, etc, etc, etc. It drives me nuts. Then you make a thorough mess of it, so you start all over again. And so it goes on and on and on and on. But eventually you get somewhere near. And I do believe the engine is starting to run slightly better. But the next thing to do is to check where the steam is being admitted to make sure that it's actually early admission and not late. This is not always possible. It depends on the geometry of the valve and various other factors. And what I'm doing now is making very fine adjustments to the position of the eccentrics to make sure that the air is admitted just before top dead centre. So while I'm making these adjustments, there is actually some compressed air going into the engine, but there's not enough pressure to make the engine run away and damage my fingers. And these adjustments really are very fine. Sometimes there'll be a 30 second of an inch difference between the engine running lumpily and really smoothly. And it's worth persevering. Well, maybe it is, maybe it isn't. But for me, I like doing it, so it's worth persevering and my engines tend to run quite well. By making sure that you have early admission on the steam, or even the compressed air, this cushions all the parts, therefore the engine is less likely to knock at each end of the stroke. What I'm really looking for are very even beats like this. It's been running for a while, I think it's time for some more oil. Steam engines use a total loss oil system, so periodically stop your engine and just give it a bit of oil. This is my usual oil mixture of steam oil, rapeseed oil and some machine oil. I'll stop talking for a short while so you can have a listen to the evenness of the beats and watch the wheel go round. That is sweet music to my ears. And have you noticed something? The engine is going backwards at the moment. And it sounds pretty close to how it does when it's going forwards. So we're making progress. And while I think about it, watching this video, which is around 15 minutes long, is probably the best way to do this job. The video that you're watching has been edited from all the footage I took while I was doing the job and it took three and a half hours to do the job from start to finish. Three and a half hours. And I'll just move the valve a little bit more this way, and I'll just move the valve a little bit more the other way, and I'll just turn the eccentric anti-clockwise, and then I'll just turn it a 30 second in a clockwise direction, and so it goes on. It really is good fun. But it's worth it in the end. There's still quite a lot more to do, but this engine is different class. Once I've tightened down the main bearings, it should be very smooth. Then I need to make some exhaust pipes, thoroughly test it, make some gaskets and put it all back together. You will notice now I'm quickly reversing the engine and putting it back into forward gear. I'll just leave it running so you can see and hear what's going on. Thanks for watching and I hope you found it useful. <laughs>